keep going with our lectures. See, in the last lecture we were talking about the approximate solutions. Out of these approximate solutions, there are two kinds. One is the creeping motion where the initial forces are very small or talking in terms of the Reynolds number, the Reynolds number is far below 1, 1 is the maximum limit and uh, then the other extreme is high Reynolds number flow. Now in case of your creeping motion, there was no mathematical issue because the order of the differential equation remains same as the original equation that is second order and you are in a position to satisfy two boundary conditions. However, when we talk about high Reynolds number flow, there are some problems that creep in, okay. So here, once you say high Reynolds number flow, what does that mean? Inertia forces are very large compared to viscous forces and if you remember your Navier-Stokes equation. The viscous forces are there on the right hand side, inertia forces on the left, okay. Now if I ignore the viscous terms thinking that they are small, what happens to your differential equation? Right hand side contains all the second order terms, d square u by dx square plus d square u by dy square plus d square u by dz square in brackets multiplied by mu. So since mu is very small, if I take the liberty of taking the viscous term 0, then the order of the differential equation changes to first order. Once it is a first order differential equation, you can satisfy only one boundary condition and that boundary condition which you can satisfy is that the velocity normal to the boundary is 0, but you cannot satisfy the other boundary condition that is the no slip condition meaning there can be no relative motion between the boundary and the fluid. So in that sense it becomes a meaningless solution, there is a solution but that will not be meaningful because you are not able to satisfy the no slip condition, okay. So here that is what it says only boundary condition 1 can be satisfied solution is not complete, limiting condition. So this is what should be done in reality means you solve first as a second order differential equation. Then at the end if the viscosity is very small in some term, that term could be dropped but not in the differential equation after you get the solution. And in fact this is the essence of Prandtl's boundary layer theory. We will come back to this Prandtl's boundary layer theory at a little later time and in fact the entire 20th century was domin uh, dominated by Prandtl's boundary layer theory and which is considered as a breakthrough in fluid mechanics. Because of this Prandtl's boundary layer theory, people were able to solve Navier-Stokes equation and get many, many meaningful answers. That is why it is very, very important. Prandtl's boundary layer theory, okay. And then this is a subject by itself and we will see what, how he tackled the problem, okay. Now before we go to the details, I will come back to this high Reynolds number flows. Let us first finish some examples in creeping motion. After all we are discussing now the approximate solutions which are broadly classified as creeping motion and high Reynolds number flows. So we'll, let us go back to our creeping motion and this is what is again I remind you that no doubt creeping motion is laminar flow but all laminar flows are not creeping motion, keep that in mind, okay. So we are talking about creeping motion. The property of a creeping motion is that the inertia forces are exceedingly small compared to the viscous terms that what is known as a creeping flow and in terms of Reynolds number 
Reynolds number should be less than 1, preferably it could be less than 0.1. Smaller the number it means more closer to your assumption that the initial terms are negligible. So body force is ignored because it is not a free surface flow. Variation of hydrostatic if you take a small particle spherical object the variation in the depth is so little that you do not have to worry about the hydrostatic variation of pressure. You drop the inertial terms then the x component of the Navier-Stokes equation gets simplified but the order is still the same intact second order. Same thing I repeat it for the y component of the Navier-Stokes equation and the z component. Having got those three by simple manipulation making use of the continuity equation one will be able to arrive at this del p equal to mu times del square q. Q stands for the velocity vector i u plus j v plus k w. Do not worry about the details it is very simple but that is what Stokes did and arrived at this equation and making use of this equation what is important here is there any density here in this equation rho density is rho of the fluid is it there this is only pressure this is viscosity this is velocity there is no density. So you see here in the differential equation density is not coming to picture does it make any physical sense density is not in picture when does the density come into picture when there is inertia when you are ignoring the inertia obviously density is not in picture. So this itself shows that the inertia quantities are not in picture that is the reason why the density is not in picture okay. So the density of the fluid does not appear this was solved analytically making use of the boundary conditions what are the boundary conditions this is second order differential equation you can satisfy normal velocity is 0 tangential velocity is 0. So making use of that he derived expressions for velocity and hence from there the various pressure around this spherical object. So there are two things see when flow is taking place there is a difference of pressure on the front and the rear back. Now the differential pressure will create a pressure drag simultaneously flow is taking place on top of the surface of the sphere. So because of viscous action that is also going to create some drag force which you call the viscous drag. So there will be two drag forces coming into picture one is due to pressure differential the other one is due to viscous action and he derived analytically these expressions and I am, we are only going to talk about the final answer because the derivation is fairly long okay maybe it will run into 6 8 pages of derivation. But finally the interesting part is here FD stands for the drag force and that subscript VIS is viscosity here also same drag force but due to pressure difference he could arrive at this answer that the viscous drag is 2 pi mu into velocity of the stream which is very slow very low but there is a velocity into diameter of the sphere. Similarly drag force due to pressure is half of this pi into mu into v into d or total drag sum of the two is 3 pi mu into v into d okay. Here again what is the peculiarity drag force is proportional to look at here for a given diameter given viscosity drag force is proportional to velocity right for a given size means the diameter is fixed for a given fluid whose viscosity is also fixed you find that drag force is proportional linear proportionality is there with the diameter of the particle. Often you would like to express the force in a non-dimensional form 
and this is a very standard way that coefficient of drag is equal to drag force divided by half rho into v square multiplied by area. Now this area of course what area you are going to use in the definition varies from problem to problem okay. But in case of a spherical object which we call a blunt body or a bluff body we will come to that later as compared to a streamlined body these shapes are called bluff bodies. So for a blunt or a bluff body the area that you take in the definition is the frontal area means projected area. And what is the projected area if it is a spherical one is a circle that is the projected area. So pi by 4 d square that is the area. So if I put that value in the definition of CD the top was the drag force found by Stokes analytically divided by half rho v square into area frontal area of the sphere is pi by 4 d square you cancel out term you will end up with 24 mu by rho into v into d which is 24 by v d divided by imagine this way mu by rho okay and that combination is what you call the Reynolds number. So finally you get an interesting answer that C D for a spherical object is equal to 24 divided by Reynolds number. Now this expression has been verified experimentally by many researchers and they find that the agreement is really very good excellent agreement you get between the predicted value and the experimental values okay. And this is true this is what is called the Stokes range if you want to add you can add a word here Reynolds number less than 1 strictly speaking 0.1 but people find experimentally that even if you go up to 1 it is okay you can still apply this relationship. But if it exceeds 1 if it is 2, 3, 4 or 10 like that do not apply this formula is no more valid. This is valid only if the Reynolds number is less than 1 that you need to keep in mind okay. Now when a spherical particle of greater density greater means compared to that of the fluid is falling obviously it attains some velocity even if you leave it from rest initially it will accelerate and after a little while it will settle at a very steady state condition and that steady state velocity is what we call the terminal velocity after that it will not increase anymore in the beginning only it accelerates okay. So when it is settling down in the fluid what are the forces that act on top of this spherical object one is the gravitational pull weight other one is its buoyancy force okay and this is the direction of motion always your drag force is acting against the direction of motion that is why the arrows are shown and it is acting all over the surface it is only shown two arrows but it is really acting a resultant of all that is only shown in the diagram all right. Now if it is settling at a constant velocity what does that mean even in the diagram if it is settling at a constant velocity means no more acceleration if there is no more acceleration all these forces must add up to zero or balance. So that what if you do see if Vt stands for the terminal velocity means that the velocity final no more change. So at that time you balance the forces this is the weight volume of the spherical object into gamma is gamma is the weight density of the solid equal to this is the weight of the displaced fluid buoyancy same volume multiplied by gamma of the fluid plus the drag force which Stoke found out as 2 sorry 3 pi mu into Vt into D or you rearrange this cancel out term you will have an expression which is a interesting and very often quoted in all books you will find this expression terminal velocity equal to d square into gamma s minus gamma f g by 18 
times mu. Here again, what is the what is the peculiarity of this equation for any given size of particle and given density, density of fluid, the terminal velocity is inversely proportional to the viscosity of the fluid. Okay. Now, where do I make use of this such a you know limited velocity? So very slow, slow velocity. So where do we really get it in practice? So some examples: the settling basin is an example. What is the settling basin? See, in many of the water treatment plants, your water that you get from the river or lakes will be having sediment particles, very fine particles. So if you pass it through a long channel slowly the particle will be slowly settling down and your design criteria is by the time I reach the other end of the channel the particle even at the surface should be able to come and rest at the bottom. So that beyond that point when I take out water from the channel the water will be relatively clean all these particles would have settled that is what you call a settling basin. More of that you will probably do in your public health some course third year or fourth year but that is what is in brief a settling basin. Silting of reservoirs you find so many reservoirs huge reservoirs since the water is static for a long time it takes months and years to pass through the reservoir. The sediment particles that are carried by the river that also settles down. And it may take months, not in minutes or seconds, it may take months, maybe years for the fine particle to settle down and come to the bottom of the reservoir. Okay. So finding the time of settlement of dust particles of some let us say volcanic eruption. Now if you know the size of the particle, you know the height of the eruption, you will be able to even predict based on Stokes terminal velocity expression Stokes law how long it will take for the particle to reach the ground okay. Now for even elaborating a little more for dust particles settling in air unit weight of air is negligible you see in the formula there was one rho of solid minus rho of fluid. So compared to the density of solid density of air is negligible. So whether I write difference of the two densities rho of solid minus rho of fluid or ignore rho of fluid simply write rho of solid it does not make a difference error is very little. Here so that can be ignored all right and uh, for a given size of particle in that case primarily it depends on the viscosity as I said. If the variation of viscosity is also not significant it means that throughout the column of air the particle will be settling at a uniform terminal velocity all right. Now if the variation of I is not significant this is fine. So this is one of the examples of creeping motion. Normally in most of the undergraduate courses or syllabus this is included. However, in your syllabus something more is included which is equally important. So what is that one? The next case or example of a creeping motion is known as the Hillesha model. Okay. Now first let us read a bit of this. I will show you the figure then we will come back again to the write up. So there is an analogy between potential flow and viscous fluid motion. You see look at the two terms we are saying viscous fluid whereas we are talking about potential flow normally what do you understand in potential flow that it is zero viscosity. But surprisingly you find that there is an analogy between very, very viscous flow and potential flow two extremes. So that was baffling many people thought how is it possible that you are talking about a viscous flow but you are able to represent that flow 
as a potential tool. But that bit of you know the confusion can be cleared with our understanding of fluid mechanics. Okay. So the justification for the analogy can be worked out based on creeping motion solution. And why is this model very popular? Because you will be conducting experiments to find the flow pattern because solving analytically a flow pattern for any odd shape of a body is very difficult. These days with your mental technique, yes, it is possible, but earlier finding a analytical expression was almost impossible. So people wanted to conduct experiments and get the flow pattern for different kinds of bodies. Okay. Now, what is first? Let me show you the the you know arrangement. What is a Hellesha model? Then we come back to our discussion here. Okay. I will look at first. Understand what it is. These are two parallel glass plates. The gap here is very small. Why do I make that glass plate very small? Because when you calculate the Reynolds number. The Reynolds number has to be exceedingly small. Then only you get creeping motion. So, although in the diagram we have blown up, made it look so big, in reality it will be very small, maybe one millimeter, two millimeter of that order. Now, this is one plate. This is another plate. This is the one looking from the top. Just for curiosity, we are putting a circular object. It's like a sandwich, a circular object. On top of that, there is a glass plate. Bottom also, there is a glass plate. It, in between that gap, fluid is flowing, and the flow being so small, you know, what I would say, so slow, it will be representing creeping motion, and the Reynolds number will be less than one. Okay. Now, through the middle of this gap, let us imagine there is a x-axis. This way is y axis and normal to the plate is your z axis. Okay. Now, here the streamlines come, curve and go all around. But at any point here, what is the velocity you have? See, velocity in reality will be a, if streamline means if you draw a tangent to that, that will represent the velocity vector, which can be resolved into a u component and a v component. Now depending on where you are, u and v are changing as you go along the path. Okay. Now what is the peculiarity of this? The peculiarity of this arrangement is h is very small compared to these dimensions x or y. Now if that be the case, what happens to the rate of change or the gradient of velocity with respect to z compared to that in the x and y direction, z dimension is exceedingly small, alright. And velocities, what are the boundary conditions to be satisfied? 0 here, 0 here. So velocity changes from 0 to some value back to 0. All that is happening in a very, very small height z or h in the z direction. So what will happen to the gradient or rate of change of velocities in the z direction compared to those in the x and y direction? It will be very large. So gradients in the z direction will be very large compared to the gradients in the y and x direction, fine. Secondly, because it is creeping motion, what will be the next logical step? It is creeping motion. So if I go to Navier-Stokes equations, what will be the logical step in a creeping motion? Drop the inertia terms, agreed? Don't worry because it is confined flow, body force is not in picture, 
So if I do that, so let me go back to our discussion here. Okay. The contour of interest of the body in that case I showed a circular one. The sandwich between two parallel blast plates having a very small gap thickness. Dye is injected back again here. This is actual setup. Dye is injected at discrete points. So the dye flows and that shows you the shape of your streamlines. So purpose of dye is to act as a tracer. Means you can take photographs and find out. So this will be the actual photograph of flow past the cylinder. How the streamlines look like. Okay. So here dye is injected at the upstream end of the tray through discrete points, and the colored line traces the streamlines. Flow visualization is helpful for complicated shapes. Streak lines show the mean flow pattern in the plane of the parallel plate. Okay. Here again, since I am injecting dye at discrete point. That means what? Same dye particle, not same, number of dye particles are injected one after another and the line at any instant if I take a photograph, the line joining those particles which came out of a single source where I am injecting, what do you call that? Streak line, you remember back again, we call streak line. So in reality what you see in the diagram taking photograph, they are the streak lines. But since the flow is a steady case, the streak lines also represent the streamlines. Is it okay? So everything has a logic. Why this is so? Why not the other thing? Okay. Dye is injected at upstream through discrete point, fine. Flow visualization is helpful for complicated thing. Streak lines show the mean flow pattern in the plane of the parallel plates. Let your x and y represent the plane midway between the, these are the one. So x, y is this way, it is in a plane midway between the two glass plates. Velocity component w, now flow is taking place in the gap. What happens to the velocity component in the w direction? The lines are only in one plane. So what happens to the velocity component in the w, sorry, in the w direction, w, which we call in the z direction, is zero. There is no velocity component this way. Velocity is only going this way. So when I take a velocity here and take the components, I will end up with u and v. W is everywhere zero. So w will not come into picture. So here, if you keep this in mind, all right. If you keep that in mind, the simplified governing equation of motion in the x direction will be dp by dx equal to mu into this. Are you clear how this comes? Back from your Navier-Stokes equation, ignore the left hand side which is your inertia terms. Actually this is on the other side, minus 1 by rho dp by dx plus mu by rho, so I am simply rearranging and this is your equation, all right. Similarly, what will happen to the y component of the Navier-Stokes equation, dp by dy equal to same thing, excepting wherever u is there, v is there. What happens to the z component of the Navier-Stokes equation? Not in picture because w is 0, so you will not have the third component, only two components are there. Is it okay? Follow the steps logically. Okay. As the gap thickness is exceedingly small, the gradients in the z direction are far bigger than the velocity gradients in x and y. The statement is important. How would this help to simplify these or make approximations? Think it logically. See, once you get the knack, everything looks very simple. Read this carefully. Gradients in the z direction are much larger compared to the gradients 
in the x and y direction. So what should be the next logical step in this equation what should I do the biggest one I retain these are relatively small similarly biggest one I retain these two are relatively small so I can further simplify this and write it as same thing dp by dx equal to mu d square u by dz square dp by dy equal to mu d square v by dz square other two small terms are dropped out other two small terms are dropped out okay this is the equation what happens to your boundary condition with respect to z see these are all differential equations second derivatives with respect to z so what are the boundary conditions with respect to z at z equal to plus or minus h by 2 the velocity should be 0 that is no slip condition so these are the boundary conditions dp by dz this is the governing equation boundary condition z equal to plus or minus h by 2 u equal to 0 similarly here again with respect to z equal to plus or minus h by 2 now your subject matter is v v should be 0 now are you able to recollect something similar earlier are you able to recollect this equation and this boundary condition or this equation and this boundary condition where where did we come across that plain Poisson flow so it is identical to what we had in plain Poisson flow and if you look at the two equations no way they are connected that means I can solve this independently this independently two independent equations and they are similar to what you have done already in case of your plain Poisson flow so we are not going to repeat again those steps of integrating twice making use of the boundary conditions find a b etc because we already know the answers for plain Poisson flow since the equation is same boundary conditions are same the answers are going to be identical and what was and remember the continuity equation of course is this quantity fine now that is why I am seeing here the above equations can be solved independently for the two velocities uv governing equation and the boundary conditions are identical to that of the plane Poisson flow distribution of u and v with respect to z will be parabolic that what we have derived earlier plane Poisson flow in nature and flow is is a flow you can check flow is rotational flow within the gap when you talk in terms of individual u and v the flow is rotational right but you will find after this flow is rotational because when in plane Poisson flow is a rotational flow but here you again recollect what we had for average velocity in the gap minus 1 by 12 okay mu is I think mu is missing here 1 by 12 mu dp by dx h square mu is missing here okay 1 by 12 so is the case okay 1 by 12 mu dp by dx h square or rewrite d by dx of p into h square by 12 mu similarly here v average equal to d by dy p into h square by 12 mu this is nothing new this is what you had in your plain Poisson flow okay so to this extent still things are not clear about what you are trying to do but the next step is the one which is most important having got this if I want to find the, the, whether the flow is rotational or not about the z axis that means in the plane of x and y 
whether there is rotation or not. What does that mean? When I say plane of x and y, means it is rotation about z axis. So, what is the rotation about the z axis? Go back to your basics again. What is omega z? Rotation half d by dy, d by dx. Let us write in terms of average velocities. Let us write average velocities. If I substitute for these average velocities, what happens finally? As you see here, d by dy of average velocity. Average velocity u is this quantity. Okay. Similarly for v, this quantity. So ultimately, they all cancel out. It comes out zero. So you see. What an interesting thing came out of all this manipulation that when you are talking about flow in terms of average velocities, the flow behaves like a rotational flow or potential flow. In reality, the flow within the gap is rotational. Keep that in mind. In terms of individual small uv, the flow is rotational. But if you average out and make you have that average velocity in your rotation, you find that the rotation comes out as zero. Now, because the gap thickness is so small, when you inject dye, it is not able to diffuse or mix. So, it is the dye is really giving an indication of the average direction of motion, that is, average velocity. So, the flow pattern that you get really is corresponding to a potential flow. So, this is why since u and v set and so one is this condition, but what is the other requirement for u average and v average to satisfy continuity equation? The argument is since individual values of small u and small v satisfy continuity equation. If I take their averages, that also will satisfy continuity equation. So, since you have satisfied the continuity equation at every point, their averages, that means u average and v average, also will satisfy continuity equation. So, mathematically speaking, you are satisfying continuity equation in terms of average velocities, you are satisfying the condition of irrotationality in terms of the average velocities. That is the reason why the flow pattern that you get is a irrotational flow pattern. Okay. So, here as you see thus the average velocity satisfies the basic requirements of a potential flow. Fact remains that the distribution of the velocity u and v within the gap is parabolic and flow is rotational similar to what you had in plane Poisson flow. However, in the experiment the average motion is seen as the streak lines which also represent the streamlines of a potential flow around the object of interest. Okay. So, see these days because of your availability of advanced technology, computers, etc., probably this kind of thing people will not try to do. But there was a time when people did not have any of those tools with them, yet they had to design, they had to really come with solution. So, this is how, this is the basis of your Helesha model and here again just keep in mind Helesha is name of the same person. Helesha, they are not two different names. He retained his mother's name as well as father's name. That is why his title is Helesha and he I think he was also teaching at the University of Liverpool for some time, wanted to demonstrate to the students how flow patterns are there and so on. And while doing some trial, accidentally something happened somewhere a crack appeared and air got in, it gave the flow pattern. So many things happen, accidentally some good things happen. And so Hilisha, you will find in go to the internet big articles on him, he has designed many of the propellers used for war planes in World War II. But that is why somebody has commented that is one of those you know 
good scientist who is not given the due credit of what he has done okay so there we talked about chi there is a some amount of reorientation in the presentation in fact in the syllabus hilesha model is towards the end at the end almost but i thought when we are talking about creeping motion unless we discuss it here the clarity will not be there because after a month you will not remember what is creeping motion so when creeping motion we are talking about that better to finish off so our rate of progress is quite different than what you will find in other section because the sequence of my coverage is very different than they might be do okay don't worry things will be covered whatever is there in the syllabus in a different fashion okay